Greetings, this is Greg. In this video, I want to answer some of the questions that have been occurring frequently in my comments section. Most are in regards to the last few videos on this channel. In a recent video about Eric Hartman, I had a picture of Robert S. Johnson, a high-scoring U.S. ace who flew in the European theater. Quite a few people have pointed out that in this picture, he appears to have kills over a Messerschmitt ME-209 and a Focke-Wulf FW-290. The truth is, those were 109s, and the FW-290, probably a 190A5 or later. So why does it say 209 and 290 on the side of his airplane? Not only that, those planes are listed in his post-combat reports, so it's clear that he thought he shot down a couple of 209s and a 290. Today, enthusiasts of World War II airplanes take some pride in being able to identify individual variants of 109s by tiny details, like the shape of the oil cooler ducting, location of an antenna, something like that. But during World War II, Allied pilots did not have that level of detailed knowledge about enemy aircraft variants, and often very little time to identify them during the stress of combat because the fog of war was pretty thick. So let's try to get an understanding of this by looking at the information a U.S. fighter pilot would have had about Luftwaffe aircraft. Let's take a look at the U.S. AAF identification manual from 1942. Here's the 109F from that manual. As you can see, the pictures are not detailed. As we flip the pages, we find this airplane, the Heinkel 113. It appears to be a tremendous airplane. It could do 400 miles per hour in level flight in early 1942, had decent range and great firepower. Clearly, this should have been the best fighter plane in the skies over Europe in early 1942. However, this plane was purely fictional. It was entirely a creation of Nazi propaganda. They used an older Heinkel, dressed it up, took pictures of it, Nobody knows the, if this idea was to fool the German public or the Allies, but either way, it was picked up on by British intelligence and they passed it on to the United States. And there were cases of Allied pilots who thought they encountered an HE-113 in battle, but of course, these were cases of mistaken identity caused by the bad intelligence. There's also a page in this manual for the ME-115, which never existed. It's another fictional fighter plane. That brings us to the ME-209. This one is a bit more complicated because it's not purely fictional, it's just somewhat fictional. The actual ME-209 that flew was a high-speed plane built to set speed records, which it did. It was very fast. In order to capitalize on this for propaganda purposes, the Germans claimed they had a fighter variant of it, which was sometimes called the ME-209, ME and sometimes called an ME-109R. Both of these are fictional. There was no way to make a real 209 race plane into a fighter for reasons that I'm not going to get into right now. Then, to further complicate this, or possibly to take advantage of the publicity of the 209 speed records, Messerschmitt started work on a new fighter, a real fighter, not a fictional one, and named it the 209. Here it is. They flew a prototype, but the design never went beyond that stage. However, the use of the name 209, of course, caused further confusion. Now, we know that what Robert S. Johnson shot down um, was a 109. So, why did those two 109s look different to him? I suspect these were 109s with the Erla Haub canopy. Not sure about that pronunciation. Sometimes it's called the Galland Hood. Now, the timing for my theory lines up very well. This book says that that canopy came out in late 1943, and Johnson's first claim of a 209 was on December 22nd of that year. This canopy makes the plane look quite a bit different, and I suspect that with the talk of 209s that was going on, that's what he thought it was. In any case, we know that he shot down 109s on those days, I'm just speculating as to why it says 209s in his combat report and on the side of the airplane. 
Now what about the FW290? This one's kind of interesting. At the time, it was commonly thought, as can be seen in this article from 1944, that the improved FW190s, which were of course coming, would be called 290s, and there is some logic to that. 109, 209, 190, 290. You might notice that nearly everything in this article turned out to be wrong. For example, the DB602 engine was an 88 liter diesel. Four of them were used on the Hindenburg. Uh, it was certainly never going to be used in a fighter plane. Nevertheless, Volker Wolf was working on a newer version or newer versions of the FW190, and I suspect that what Johnson shot down that day was an A5 as it's slightly longer than the earlier versions and has a pretty different look to it as compared to the A3s. It could not have been a Dora 9. That was the first thing that came to my mind. But the Dora 9s showed up after he left the theater. Now the next question I see coming up a lot is in regard to my video on German aviation fuels. In that video, I point out that the Germans were for the most part unable to, or at least not taking advantage, of the full octane rating and capability of their late war C3 fuel because they ran it at relatively lean mixtures. So the question that's coming up is, could that have been done in an effort to increase fuel economy? And the answer is no. I do understand why someone might think that, though. I mean, on the surface, it makes a lot of sense. After all, Germany had a serious fuel shortage, and fuel conservation was on their minds, but we're talking about mixtures at war emergency power, not in normal flying, and maybe I didn't specify that enough in that uh, video. It was a pretty long video. Anyhow, at normal cruise power or during climbs and descents, the mixture was optimized for fuel economy on German airplanes and the planes of all the other air forces. The issue here is that at war emergency power, the mixture is too lean for optimal anti-knock performance, thus limiting manifold pressure and thus horsepower. Now at war emergency power, and keep in mind different pilot manuals call that power setting different things, but you guys are smart enough to know what I'm talking about here. Anyway, at that power setting, fuel conservation is not on the list of priorities. If your plane gets shot down, you lose all the fuel it's carrying, plus the plane, maybe the pilot. Richening the mixture for three minutes, uh, the three minutes that the pilot might be using that power setting, isn't going to make much difference in total fuel burned for the flight, and it could likely make the difference between victory or defeat. That's why the power setting is there, is for those situations where it could make that difference. Now, when the engineers are trying to figure out just how much power they can get away with for emergency use only, um, especially in regards to an emergency use setting that's very time limited, they're not focusing on fuel economy. They are focusing on fuel economy for cruise power, but not maximum power or war emergency power. I think the reason they used the lean mixture was due to fuel getting in the oil, but that's only a theory. I think it's a pretty solid theory, but I can't say for sure. I think the last thing I'll cover here is the claim that Eric Hartman was never shot down. I don't believe it, and I explain why I don't believe it in the video. Some people have accused me of making a straw man argument, saying that nobody ever claims he wasn't shot down. Now, I certainly don't mind learning when I'm wrong about something. That does occasionally happen in these videos. I'm not perfect. Nobody is. Uh, for example, in that very video, I mentioned that this German super ace, Walter Schuck, became a school teacher and seemed to fade into the background. I couldn't find any interviews with him or much of anything. Some viewers corrected me. It turns out he wrote a book. I didn't know about it, but I'm glad I do now. If I can find an English language copy, I plan to read it. So I'm appreciative of uh, finding out that I was wrong on that. But with regards to the common claim that Hartman was never shot down, I find it odd that I even have to, ex to defend the existence of that claim. In his final interview, Hartman makes it clear that he was never shot down. And he also says this in an interview that's on video. A quick search of the internet turns up tons of results saying he was never shot down. So that's enough about that. Now I do try to answer all the questions in the comments sections. Sometimes I don't. 
often because it requires an answer that's just too complex for the comments section, so I'll respond by saying that. But other times, I just miss the question. Um, it's not that I'm being rude or, or ignoring you. It's just the way the YouTube comment system is structured. Here's something that most people don't know, at least most people that aren't content creators on YouTube. Content creators like myself receive the comments on a specific page in the YouTube studio. That way we don't have to sift through all the videos on the channel to check for the comments. Notice that my last four comments are from four different videos. That's pretty typical. They just come to me in chronological order and I answer them as best I can. If I had to click through and load 80-something videos, that would take forever. So the YouTube Studio is how most content creators find the comments on their channels. However, if you respond to my answer, in other words, you make a comment or a, you, make, you pose a question and I respond to that and then you respond to my response, that's not going to appear back at the top of the list. Thus, if you're commenting under a comment that's more than a few days old, I'll never see it because it's buried below hundreds of comments I've already read. So it's not that uh, I don't want to see it. It's just that the way they come in, I don't. For example, here's an ongoing conversation that currently is getting new comments all the time. But because it started 17 hours ago, I would not normally see any of these comments other than the first one, which I would have seen when it first came uh, into the feed. And this particular comment is some people arguing over whether uh, Eric Hartman really shot down 352 airplanes or not, and, and it's a valid discussion. I'm just not in it. Now, my point here is that if I seem to drop out of a conversation with you, it's not that I'm being rude. It's not that I've started to ignore you. It's just that the YouTube system makes it very difficult for me to find a comment that's more than a couple days old. This is especially true if you're commenting sometime shortly after a, a new video has been released because new videos tend to cause a relative avalanche of comments. Now, of course, I have a Patreon page and I do answer all questions there because they don't get lost in the shuffle. Furthermore, I often release videos to Patreon members a little bit before they go public and specifically because the lower volume of initial views ensures that I don't miss comments or questions or from Patreon supporters. That's the reason I do that. That's all I have for now. Thanks to all my subscribers. I really appreciate the views, the thumbs up and the comments and special thanks to my Patreon supporters. They make this channel possible. Have a great day.